Good afternoon. Welcome, everyone. Uh, let's get started, right? Thank you all for being here today. Um, we ask that after the ceremony, after it's ended, uh, that you make your way to the Latino community room just across the lobby for a gathering and continued celebration. That'll be right after this is over. First, the San Francisco Public Library acknowledges that we occupy the unceded ancestral homeland of the Ramaytush Ohlone peoples, who are the original inhabitants of the San Francisco Peninsula. <clears throat> we recognize that we benefit from living and working on their traditional homeland. As uninvited guests, we affirm their sovereign rights as first peoples and wish to pay our respects to the ancestors, elders, and relatives of the Ramaytush community. Now, welcome to the 43rd annual Northern California Book Awards. San Francisco Public Library is honored for the opportunity to host this event each year and play a part in celebrating all the amazing works by Northern California authors and California translators statewide. <clears throat> Please welcome to the stage the editor and publisher of Poetry Flash, and host of the Northern California Book Awards, Joyce Jenkins. Thank you, thank you Alejandro. I'm so grateful to be here. Welcome to the 43rd annual Northern California Book Awards. I'm, as you heard, I'm Joyce Jenkins and um, Poetry Flash and Chair of Northern California Book Reviewers, a volunteer association of reviewers, editors, and others who write passionately about books. This ceremony celebrates books published in 2023 by Northern California authors and California translators. These awards are presented by Poetry Flash with the world-class San Francisco Public Library and community partners, Mechanics Institute and Women's National Book Association, San Francisco chapter. We love you. Each year, we come together over books. We read and discuss and fret over them. You wouldn't believe. We get right down there into the minutia seeking the best from hundreds of titles, finding in these books what we need to guide us through our cultural, political, and personal sea changes these days. Today, we gratefully celebrate all of these exceptional authors. From our point of view, every single nominated book is our strong recommendation to you and readers, all the readers we can reach, and um, all of these books are winners in our book. The Northern California Book Awards celebrate excellence and diversity. We believe we are stronger together and better when we are learning together. If you are a book reviewer and would like to join us, contact me. Let's draw a bigger circle together. The Northern California Book Reviewers who selected these books are listed with gratitude at the back of your program. The comments you hear today were all written by them, by NCBR judges, and will be posted on the Northern California Book Awards page at poetryflash.org. If you hear your name called, please come right on up. Don't hesitate. Up these stairs, and um, winners, you'll have three minutes, and we want to hear more. So um, we'll start with the children's literature, younger readers category. Nominees are, how does Santa go down the chimney? Mac Barnett, illustrated by John Classen. Mac Barnett and illustrator John Classen are back together again to create a whimsical tale that asks the age-old question, how does Santa go down the chimney? Their story explores both practical and fanciful permutations of how Santa delivers presents on Christmas Eve. To boldly go, 
how Nichelle Nichols and Star Trek helped advance civil rights, Angela Dalton, illustrated by Lauren Semmer. This enthusiastic biography begins with the author's black family settling in for TV night with Star Trek. They delight in Nichols' character, Lieutenant Yohura, thrilled to see a black character in the show. Nichols' character moved from ballet into singing and acting, cast in Star Trek before anyone realized how popular it would be. She helped develop her character. Bright illustrations tell the tale of a performer who came to realize the impact of her work. The Shape of You, Muang T. Vaughn, illustra illustrated by Mickey Sato. In this beautifully, beautifully illustrated heartwarming meditation on the shapes of familiar and unfamiliar things, a long poem reaches from the shape of the earth, a sphere, to the shape of a mother's fingers. The shape of you succeeds in connecting young children to community, friendship, family, and the security of being cherished by loving adults while stimulating their intellectual curiosity and inspiring them to see universal forms in the world around them. The Younger Readers Award goes to To Boldly Go, how Nichelle Nichols and Star Trek helped advance civil rights. Angela Dalton, illustrated by Lauren Summer. Angela? Oh, you're here. Bless your heart. Oh, I'm so delighted. Okay. Here, let me give you this. Let me give you this. Oh, my gosh. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, my gosh. Thank you so much. Um, Wow. <laughs> Thank you so much. I did not, I hoped to win, but I didn't expect to win. It's hard being the first person if the rest of you don't cry, because I'm going to cry. I'm going to be really upset. Um, it is such an honor, really such an honor, to be uh, in community with Mac Barnett and John Clausen and uh, Muan T. Uh, what? I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. Mickey Soto, um, I'm so nervous right now. Uh, please excuse me. It's, I mean, I'm so honored to be in community with all of you. Um, uh, I, I, I want to say thank you so much to Harper Kids and Lauren Summer. I mean, New York Times Illustrated, best uh, New York Times Illustrator. Lauren Summer, when she said yes to this book, I literally cried. I was so happy. If you've not seen her book that she illustrated, The ABCs of Black History, please check it out. It's a beautiful book. So when she said yes to this book, I was just, I, I, I just, I couldn't believe it. Um, but, okay, I only have three minutes, Angela, get it together. Um, so I could say, I could go on and on, but um, this book, Nichelle Nichols impacted my life so much as a young kid. Um, the story opens up uh, with really myself and my, fa and my mom and my dad um, watching Nichelle Nichols. And at the time, I didn't really understand why my parents looked with such pride at Nichelle Nichols, this black woman, having agency and authority and command with uh, this diverse group of men. And now, as an, as an older woman, um, I understood like the impact that she had of black people seeing themselves the way that they should be seen. And, um, and so it started my love for space exploration. It started my love for uh, the for astronomy and um, what was possible, and knowing that black people were the future and were in the future. Um, so when I wrote this book, it was my love letter to Nichelle Nichols and giving me just the possibilities of knowing that I belonged in the future and I had. Um, I had agency in the future. And unfortunately, she passed away the summer that the book came out. And I had all these dreams and fantasies of being able to present the book to her, but that didn't happen. What did happen, though, was that um, her sister was so loving and car caring. And she um, reached out and actually uh, pr invited 
Lauren and I to be the first speakers of the series of a foundation that she's continued in Nichelle's legacy. And so we have an ongoing relationship with both Marion Smothers, Nichelle's sister, and uh, Jean Roddenberry's son, Rod Roddenberry. Um, and so we have been able to read the book to them. And so when we found out we were nominated, I reached out to Marion and she wrote um, a lovely letter which I'd love to share with you all today. Dear Angela, congratulations on your nomination in the Northern California Book Awards Children's Literature category. I was so honored to read a children's book that so enchantingly brought to life the story of my beautiful trailblazing sister, Nichelle Nichols. Your telling of the story and its lovely illustrations by Lauren Summer visually brought back so many happy memories of those wondrous days gone by. Nichelle's story is historic, and you aptly brought the, to light the many challenges of the day, from the civil rights being fought in the streets of Alabama and Mississippi to the disrespect she endured even on set. Those were some transitional days for us all. She was a fierce advocate for justice. It was her vision to persevere, uh, preserve her place and all who came after her in the future. So she became an instrument of change by convincing NASA that the time had come to recruit minorities. She was instrumental in the program that brought in the black and brown men and women into the space program. It is important that these stories be told to our children and into Boldly Go, you have captured a way to tell it that is at once beautiful and inspiring. Thank you so much, Marion Smothers. And so today I say thank you for not only nominating this book, but awarding this book, because in this day of book challenges and bans, it is so important that we keep the legacy alive of people like Nichelle Nichols and so many others whose work was hidden and is now trying to be erased. And it's important that our children remember the fight that is being done, that has been done, and that continues, that needs to be done, that we create a diverse and an, equity, an equitable, an inclusive environment because the black, uh, sorry, the future is black, it is female, and it is for us all. And we have to remember that going forward so we can have a future like Star Trek wanted it to be, just like Gene Roddenberry envisioned it for all of us. So thank you. Thank you, thank you, Angela. The nominees in middle grade are the Eyes in the Impossible, Dave Eggers, illustrated by Sean Harris. Freedom begins the moment we forget ourselves. This observation is from Johannes, a free-running dog who lives in a large urban park near the sea, not unlike Golden Gate Park, and presages the narrative arc of this wonderfully creative story in which all the main characters are animals. He has a series of adventures, both suspenseful and humorous. In the process, the doggy learns who he is, and the story reveals itself as a classic coming of age tale. Farther Than the Moon, Lindsay Lackey. Junior astronauts reach beyond the stars to find differently abled inclusion in this meticuli meticulously researched and vibrantly written coming of age story. After their father leaves, 13-year-old Houston Stewart promises his younger brother, who has cerebral pal palsy, that they will visit space together one day. Along the way, Houston learns about the space program his family, himself, and how to transcend limitations that sometimes keep our dreams out of reach. Bumi's boombox, Shanti Sakaran, a fresh take on the classic Wrinkle in Time. This book tells 12-year-old Bumi Kapalan's account of the painful year following her father's death from COVID. Bumi's support system is failing. There she finds, then she finds her father's old boombox with his note saying, you can change your life, and a mixtape time machine that allows her to reunite with him when he was her age. Bumi realizes that our beloved dead are always with us so long as we remember them. The award goes to 
farther than the moon, Lindsay Lackey. So come on up, Lindsay. Okay, wow, yeah, I wasn't expecting that, so um, thank you so much. I am so honored uh, to just even have been nominated alongside Dave and Shanti. I, your books are absolutely incredible. I loved both of them, so this is a huge honor. Um, I am really doubting my ability to read emails now, and I thought that I was supposed to read a passage from my book. Is that true? Should I do that? <laughs> I could have totally made that up, but I'm going to do that. So. Um, this is just a little section from the prologue of the story. And just as she mentioned in the uh, description, Houston and his younger brother, Robbie, um, their father in this prologue has left the family about five days before this. Did you know that the footprints of Neil Armstrong and Buzz Aldrin are still up there in the moon dust? Robbie sucked his tongue, making a frog sound in the back of his throat. It was one of those Robbie sounds with several different meanings, maybe contentment or distraction or even sadness. There's no wind or rain or anything up there, so their tracks will stay forever. Houston took a deep breath. Someday, I'm going to see them for myself, he said quietly, fiercely. Robbie thumped his left fist against his skinny legs, and Houston reached for Robbie's iPad, holding it up so his brother could see the screen. He supported Robbie's small wrist, wrinkling his nose a little when he felt the slick trail of drool still on Robbie's skin. The light from the screen reflected in his brother's dark brown eyes as he focused, searching for what he wanted to say. Mom had gotten Robbie this iPad only a month ago, but he was already really good at using it to express his thoughts. Robbie was only five, so he couldn't read the words yet, but the squares of simple illustrations were perfect for him. Houston waited patiently, holding Robbie's wrist steady so his fingers could tap the boxes he needed. Finally, the words Robbie wanted to say appeared along the top. You brother, go moon? Houston had loved astronauts in space for as long as he could remember, but he'd never really thought about leaving Earth for real, not until five days ago. I'm gonna be an astronaut, he told his brother, Saying the words out loud made his heart beat hard in his chest. He knew with an urgent clarity he'd never felt in his entire eight years of life that the words were true. He was going to be an astronaut. He was going to go to space. Robbie was still and quiet for a long moment, his eyes drifting back toward the heavens. Then he concentrated on the screen again. You brother, leave Robbie. Houston went as cold as the dark side of the moon. He thought of Robbie's face as the two of them had listened to the engine growl of Dad's truck fading down the long driveway. Robbie had banged his head against the headrest of his wheelchair over and over, silent tears streaming down his pale cheeks. You brother, go moon, leave Robbie. No. Houston pulled Robbie's hand from his mouth and held it in his own. I won't leave you, Robbie, I promise. Thank you. I also just want to say that about 10 years ago, I asked my brother-in-law, um, who has cerebral palsy and who the character of Robbie is based on, if he would like to see himself in a book one day. Because I had read books with characters that had cerebral palsy, but not many. And um, none that represented the experience that my brother-in-law has. Um, he's nonverbal. He is, uh, of course, in a wheelchair. He's 100% dependent on care. And cerebral palsy is a spectrum. And so my brother-in-law's at the most severe end of the spectrum that you can get. And I tell you, he, as I said, he's nonverbal, but he communicates. <laughs> and he blinks for yes. And when I asked him if he wanted to see himself in a book one day, I have never seen anyone blink more quickly or enthusiastically than in that moment. Um, so this award is definitely dedicated to Matthew and to everyone like him who hears you can't or there's no place for you or we don't know how to make this work for you all the time. Um, may they boldly go where um, no one has gone before and may we all learn to make space. Ha <laughs> ha for everybody. <laughs> Thank you very much.
Thank you. The young adult nominees are The Coldest Winter I Ever Spent, Anne Jacobus. After a past suicide attempt, I, 18 year old Dell does her utmost to remain sober. She also volunteers at a suicide prevention hotline while living with Aunt Fran in San Francisco because her, because her mother is deceased and her father estranged. Though she saves lives at work, she discovers she can't save the person she cares about the most when her beloved aunt is diagnosed with terminal cancer. An inspirational testament to the healing power of familial connection. All the Yellow Sons, Malavika Kanan, 16-year-old Indian-American Maya Krishnan is very protective of her single mom and multicultural immigrant community. However, she knows not to challenge the status quo of the conservative Florida suburb in which she lives. Her enigmatic classroom, classmate, Juno, on the other hand, is white, wealthy, and reckless, particularly with affairs of the heart. Themes of identity, racism, and misogyny are explored with astute perception. Accountable. The true story of a racist social media account and the teenagers whose lives it changed. Dashka Slater. Dashka Slater knows that no one is the villain in their own story and that this doesn't change the fact that real world harm can arise from an impulsive act, perhaps especially on social media. This is a journalistic, but also lyrical exploration of a group of Albany High School students here in the Bay Area after one of them launches an anonymous Instagram account featuring racist content against several black classmates in 2017. The Young Adult Award goes to Accountable Dashka Slater. Are you here, Dashka? Oh, Dashka, there you are. It's beautiful. Thank you for the great work. Aww. Thank you, Joyce. <laughs> Wow, okay, so um, I got up at 4.30 this morning to go do this. Um, I jumped off a boat and swam from Alcatraz to San Francisco. So um, this has been an amazing day, and I have had ample opportunity to just uh, think about how amazing this place that we live is. So not only do we have this incredibly beautiful natural environment, but we have this incredible literary community. And I just want to express my heartfelt gratitude for the community that raised me, really. Uh, I, at 19, I was interning for Poetry Flash with Joyce. <laughs> and I have spent my entire adult life working in this context with all of these amazing writers and readers who have welcomed me and nourished me at every step. So uh, just like pinch yourself, it's true, we live in this incredible place. Um, swimming in the bay is always an adventure. Like you never know whether it's gonna be like it was yesterday or completely different. Each swim it has different weather, different tides, different currents, different wind, different water temperature. And writing a book is a lot like that. Uh, day to day, book to book, it's always completely different. And Accountable is absolutely the most difficult story that I have ever written. It was absolutely harrowing and draining to try and do justice to this incredibly difficult story and to make sure that my work lived up to the trust that was placed in me by the young people who I write about. And so I want to express my gratitude to them for 
being willing to go on that journey with me and revisit some of the darkest times in their life and to share not only their stories, but also the full contents of their phones, all their photos and their journals and their direct messages and um, all kinds of stuff that created this uh, the fabric of this story. When I went to them and asked them if they were willing to tell their story and tell their story to me, uh, one of the things that I said is that I believe that something good can come out of all of this pain. And they trusted me, and they believed that as well, that other people could learn from what they had experienced, and that maybe we could do some work to prevent other racist social media accounts. Um, and there are ones at every high school in the country. I mean, I can't tell you how often I hear similar stories, not ones that had quite all of the twists and turns in, as Albany High Schools, but very, very similar. And so this work of opening up conversations so that um, kids might be able to learn what to do and what not to do without having to learn the hard way by doing it or having it done to them. So this is the great mission of the work that I do when I write nonfiction for young people. It's because I believe that if we can open up conversations and have these important discussions and help kids see beyond their immediate social circle, their immediate experience, and understand the people around them and the historical context in which they live, that something good can come out of that process. And so the third group of people that I want to thank, um, in addition to the people in the book and this incredible community and all the writers who have been nominated and all the readers on the committees, uh, I want to thank everyone who takes the conversation um, to the young people around them, who is a reader, who is a teacher, who is a librarian, and honors that incredible potential that happens when people talk to one another and tell each other their own stories and think through the ethics and the questions of justice that are before us. So thank you all. Um, I too read my email, and so I'm gonna read you a very short excerpt um, from the book. This is the very beginning prologue. Looking back, it's hard not to wonder how the whole thing could have been prevented. All the sorrow, all the fear, all the rage. All the lives derailed, all the milestones missed, all the plans upended. The hearings, the lawsuits, the brokenness that settled over everyone involved. The undefinable and uncountable losses, the friendships wrecked, the optimism withered, the joy stolen. Somebody could have spoken up before it went that far, before the entire town was shattered. But who? The people closest to it were caught up in the group's centripetal force, the whirl of jokes and banter that kept them all together. To speak up would have meant risking being thrown out of orbit. At the time, that was the worst thing any of them could imagine, being mocked by the group, being exiled, being alone. But just because it felt impossible to say something doesn't mean it was. Any of the top dogs in the group could have done it, or even someone on the periphery who couldn't have been shamed into shutting up. It wouldn't have required any long speeches or dramatic pronouncements. Just one phrase would have done the trick. Dude, this is really fucked up. Thank you. Now, the NCBA Groundbreaker Award goes to Transit Books. <laughs> Transit Books is a Berkeley-based nonprofit publisher of international and American literature, fiction, narrative nonfiction, essay, and literature for children. 
Pushing the Boundaries of Form, founded in 2015 by Ashley Nelson Levy and Adam Z. Levy. The co-publishers share a penchant for taking risks on authors who go unnoticed by the major houses and whose work pushes the boundaries of what's possible in literature. Transit Books Ethos is at the heart of each title in its publishing catalog, the crossing of borders of language, place, and form. Transit authors have received every, you know, numerous prestigious awards, including the Nobel Prize in Literature. Accepting the award are Ashley Nelson Levy and Adam Z. Levy. Are you here? Please come up. That was such a lovely introduction. I feel like we should just curtsy and sit back down. <laughs> um, hi, everyone. So I'm, I'm Ashley, and this is Adam. Uh, we're the founders of the press. Thank you so much to the Northern California Book Awards and the Northern California Book Reviewers for a press rooted in the Bay Area and deeply invested in our local literary culture. This recognition means everything to us. And we're incredibly honored and grateful to be invited here today. As was mentioned, we're a nonprofit publishing house committed to the discovery and promotion of enduring works that carry readers across borders and communities. We publish a carefully curated list of literary fiction, narrative nonfiction, essay, and literature for children. And our authors have been won or been finalists for the National Book Award, the National Book Critics Circle Award, the Booker Prize, the Penn Translation Prize, and last year, the Nobel Prize in Literature, giving Adam and me and our printers the greatest shock of our life. The dream of the press uh, was born over a decade ago when Adam and I were working and publishing in New York. We noticed a large, disheartening gap between readers of international and American literature. And we talked about what a list would look like that would close that distance. We wanted to introduce readers to books from around the world that weren't afraid to take risks on the page. Books often overlooked or underpublished by commercial houses and to champion them here in the US. When we moved to the Bay Area, where I'm originally from, in 2014, we found such a welcoming home in the literary community. And it suddenly appeared to be the moment to take the leap and to try and be as brave and bold as the authors and the translators we wanted to publish. This year, we moved into a new space in Berkeley where we're looking forward to holding more events, conversations, and occasions to bring our wonderful community together. It remains as critical as ever to be able to shine a spotlight on voices and literatures beyond our borders and to engage meaningfully with art that is the capacity to educate the heart and deepen our literary and political imaginations. Thank you so much again for recognizing the vitality and importance of international voices in the art of translation, both here in the Bay Area and around the world. Thank you. Thank you so much, and I'm sure we'll be seeing a lot of oh, incredible books from transit in, in the future. Next, NCBR member Sharon Coleman will present the California Translation and Poetry Award. Sharon? Hello, thank you so much for coming out. Um, it's always a pleasure to read literature from other countries um, and to, to really broaden um, aesthetic, cultural, historical senses. Um, so our nominees for the California Translation and Poetry Award are A Cha Chong Tang That Does Not Exist by Derek Chung, translated from Chinese by Mei Huang. In her debut book of translation, rising star Mei Huang introduces us to the Hong Kong poet Derek Chung, whose poetry renders loosely metaphoric the daily life of Hong Kong, the streets, the stray dogs, the bleach, the fish markets, 
spent firecrackers, kitchen smoke, cigarettes, potato soup, and so much more. Huang's translation deftly transposes Chung's work into a rich poetic language in English, creating webs of association in the new language. Through the Walls of Solitude by Alamo Oliveira, translated from Portuguese by Denise Borges. This translation of Alamo Oliveira's poetry introduces us to a major contemporary poet from the Azores, whose work is celebrated in the Portuguese-speaking countries. Oliveira's poetry lyrically weaves metaphysical and aesthetic concerns with the geopolitical reality of living on an isolated archipelago in the Atlantic. Denise Borges has de adeptly translated the delicate timber and soul depth of Oliveira's poetic vision. This book is a gift to the English language. Whoever Drowned Here, Max Sessner, translated from German by Francesca Bell. In his English language debut, contemporary poet Max Sessner reminds us, the reader, of the eerie, the enveloping precision of the dream. Appearing in our waking moments, the dream evokes what translator Francesca Bell calls in her introduction to the collection the strange magic of the ordinary. Again and again, these meditative poems reveal an ever-present, quiet reality that exists just beneath the noise of the world. Columns by Nikolai Zabolotsky, translated from the Russian by Dmitry Manin. Dmitry Manin, retranslation of Nikolai Zabolotsky's columns brings out the full charge of this experimental and iconoclastic poetics. It depicts an early post-revolutionary urban USSR and a series of gritty vignettes that brings to life an outdoor market, a late night bar, a brothel, a wedding, soccer, street cats, and what much, much more. This bilingual edition with a generous preface and introduction brings context to the American readers. And the winner for California Translation and Poetry Award goes to a Cha Chan Teng that does not exist. by Derek Chung and translated from Chinese by Mei Huang. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Um, hang on, let me pull this up. I want to thank the Northern California Book Reviewers, Poetry Flash, and everyone involved, really, for, for this. Um, it's such an honor to be recognized among such esteemed writers and translators, and especially a lot of times translators' work doesn't go recognized, so really thank you so much for this. Um, I also want to thank the American Literary Translators Association, my mentor, Jennifer Feely, a brilliant translator, uh, my publisher, Zephyr Press, and my family for their extraordinary support. Of course, I also want to thank Derek Chung, who is not just the author I translate, but a true collaborator, and his poems really capture the heart of Hong Kong. So a cha chan ting, you might be wondering what that is. Uh, it's a Hong Kong style diner, and it, it's, some, it's something so quintessential to Hong Kong culture that I can't imagine Hong Kong without it. When I was growing up in Hong Kong, there was one right across where I lived. Um, so, today, so, so today, I'd like to read the titular poem from this collection that, right, that's about a cha chan ting that does not exist. <laughs> a cha chan ting that does not exist. I scour my memories for you while patterns on the tiles grow blurrier. Shadows of feet sway be between unextinguished cigarette butts. Discreet chewing sounds have vanished around the corner. 
How do I verify the month and year of the tea stains still on the glass table? Was the cheek of Emperor Guan on the furnace always red? Or was that the candle's reflection? Or maybe there was never an emperor, only a few cans of longevity piled together, overlooking yellow receipts seeping into freshly brewed tea. I like the thickness of old style porcelain cups with indents lining the rims as if concealing different stories, slipping through a stack of bills skewered together, the confused way that waiter no longer knows where to begin. The stories sit above his apron pocket as his handwriting spreads and dissolves into his notebook. Still, a few strokes persist. Road construction signs stand outside the glass door, railings slowly circle around, then one day are suddenly torn down. Tea is hot, then cool, then warmed by our hands. Words and footsteps come and go from the door. Those who don't leave choose to lie low in unnoticed places. Just like your unlit name, after so many years, I don't suppose that among the innumerable chain stores, I would have remembered you if you and that coffin shop didn't share a name. Thank you so much. Thank you. NCBR member Zach Rogo will present the California Translation and Poetry Award. Zach? And you could, well, you, you should just. I heard a few people say prose. Yes, prose. <laughs> no, did I say something different? You said poetry. Oh, I'm so sorry. It's, in, it's ingrained in me. I can't, I can't. But anyway, prose. Prose. The nominees for the California Translation and Prose Award are The Short End of the Zonen Allee by Thomas Brussig, translated from German by Jonathan Franzen and Jenny Watson. A Send Up of Dictatorship, this book is a Bildungsroman, a fun and funny coming of age story set in East Germany in the shadow of the Berlin Wall. Translators Jonathan Franzen and Jenny Watson capture the book's tongue-in-cheek humor and oddball characters with grace and panache. The next nominee is Blue Hunger by Viola Di Grado, translated from Italian by Jamie Richards. This is an edgy, poetic book about a woman from Rome who travels all the way to Shanghai to teach Italian following her twin brother's untimely death. The teacher then falls into a steamy and complicated affair with one of her female students. Jamie Richards artfully renders the daring and lyrical qualities of the author's prose. And the third nominee is Whale by Chian Myung Kwan, translated from Korean by Chi Young Kim. This novel is a modern day epic, a fairy tale firmly rooted in nitty gritty reality. The main character, a salt of the earth woman named Gyeombok, epitomizes resilience, determination, compassion, ingenuity, curiosity, and sensuality. Chi Young Kim's translation skillfully conveys both the mythic and the earthy diction of the novel's prose as well as the author's hilarious wry asides that lighten the book's tone. And the award for the California Translation in Prose goes to Whale by Chian Myung Kwan, translated from Korean by Chi Young Kim. This is, a, this is a really wonderful book. My reading group is reading it next month. I very much recommend all three of these books. Chi Young Kim could not be with us today, so I'm accepting the award on her behalf, and I'm going to read a short passage from Whale. At this point in the novel, the heroine, Giambak, a poor young woman from a little town in the countryside, has come to a port city where she makes a living selling dried fish, and she's being uh, wooed by a gangster. He was standing outside the movie theater wearing a snow-white suit. Would you like to tour the theater, he said. She looked up at him. The man's pale, thin face was marred by a long scar on one cheek. He took out a silver lighter and lit his cigarette in a suave manner. 
but his, own, but his hand only had two fingers, his thumb and forefinger. What's a theater? she asked, squinting up at the man. A theater's where they show movies. He pointed to a hand-painted marquee, which pictured a blonde and a man in a cowboy hat, gazing at each other, their, their faces drawn close together. And what's a movie? Giambach, like most of the folks in that city, had no idea what a movie was. People do things in movies. Oh, there are plenty of people out here, so why bother watching them in a theater? Giambach asked primly. People in movies are different from people out here in the world. They're special, like you. So then the gangster talks her into going into the theater with him. That day, Giambach watched her first movie. People said incomprehensible things to each other on a big screen. They grew bigger and smaller at will, rode through a desert on horses, shot their guns, and a man and a woman kissed in the back of a wagon. Giambach couldn't take her eyes away from the screen because of the vivid, shocking scenes and the majestic sounds pouring over her. She trembled in her seat, letting the man with the scar hold her hand with his two fingers. And she was so focused on that movie that she wouldn't even have noticed if she had been holding the man's toes. <laughs> the movie ended and the lights went up and the enchanting world vanished instantly. Giambach felt hoodwinked. She couldn't get up. She felt drained and disappointed as if she'd been building up to an orgasm but had been torn away without achieving bliss. At that moment, she wished the amazing world that had been before her eyes would continue forever. If someone could make that happen, she thought, she would exchange everything she had for it and never regret her choice. <laughs> Okay. NCBR member James LeCure will present the General Nonfiction Award. Jim? Every year getting older. This is an amazing group of minds, creative people. There's not one part of this organization, this association that Joyce hasn't touched. So if you know anybody who would like to support it, support her, it's getting harder, you know. Get those deep pockets sent this way. The <clears throat> Northern California nonfiction nominees are inflamed. Abandonment, heroism, and outrage in wine country's deadliest firestorm. Anne E. Belden, Paul Gullickson, Lauren Spates. This extensively researched book chronicles the devastating effects of the ferocious 2017 wine country fire that ravaged Santa Rosa, with a focus on the occupants of two high-end senior living faculties, facilities. Excuse me. The authors create a dramatic narrative of fragile lives put at risk, due in large part to the negligence of most of the home's administrators. They just weren't there. First person accounts of those on the scene create a terrifying picture of the hours these residents waited to be evacuated. Immeasurable outcomes. Teaching Shakespeare in the Age of the Algorithm by Gail Green. Teaching liberal arts is an art. The myriad standardized public school exams we now have are an effort by political conservatives to exert control, destroying the joy of education. Democracy is messy, and no one has ever portrayed the messy details of humanity better than Shakespeare. Gail Green captures what it is to be a teacher, 
when the effort to destroy fee, free thinking threatens everyone. If you ever wondered what it is to teach or if you ever taught, you should read this beautifully written book. The Hungry Season, A Journey of War, Love, and Survival, Lisa M. Hamilton. This tells the compelling story of Ai Moa, a woman from Hmong village in Laos. Her ancestors were pushed out of their Chinese lowlands by imperial Han armies to make a subsistence living in the mountains. Facing hostile armies, unkind in-laws, a husband who beat her, near starvation diet, and the birth of 11 children, I perseveres to achieve a relatively happy life in the San Fernando Valley. Lyrical descriptions of an agrarian life unknown to most of us. Going infinite, the rise and fall of a new tycoon, Michael Lewis. Samuel Bankman freed crypto king for a year, amassed 22 and a half billion dollar fortune in such a short time that many of the most powerful people and corporations came crawling to him with a billion dollar offers for a fraction of a share in his business. Michael Lewis, author of The Big Short and Moneyball, traveled with him during a wild time in which Bankman Freed became the richest man under 20. And then it was all over. Freedom to win. A Cold War story of the courageous hockey team that fought the Soviets for the soul of its people, an Olympic gold, by Ethan Shiner. The book's title says it all. This fast-paced narrative with vividly realized characters and dramatic accounts shows the determination of a captive nation to regain its freedom. After losing to the Russians in the 1976 Olympics, the Czech team defeated the Russians at the 1998 Winter Olympics in Nagano, Japan, winning the gold medal with a score of one to zero to a swell of national pride. <clears throat> The general nonfiction award goes to Immeasurable Outcomes. <laughs> Teaching Shakespeare in the Age of the Algorithm, Gail Green, a beautiful, beautiful book. I'm truly honored because, you know, this is not just my story. It's partly my story, but it's really the story of the humanities, the death of the, the crisis of the humanities. They're, they're, to announce the death is a little premature, but <laughs> you all know, <laughs> you all know they're in crisis. And so I was coming up to the end of my, you know, I first heard the, the term war on education, I thought it was a hyperbole, but it's really not. <laughs> and it's not a conspiracy thought either. So I was coming up to the end of a long and very happy, uh, I said the wrong one, okay, um, a career, like 47 years in the classroom. And suddenly I was finding my field trashed. Um, humanities, you know, cut, as you all know, small liberal arts colleges of the sort I taught were, are going belly up by the dozens and programs are being cu uh, cut and majors and entire schools closing down and there are more people, more undergraduates majoring in computer science at the moment 
than in all the humanities subjects, history, literature, arts, film, political science, I mean, you know, STEM and computer science. And meanwhile, of course, tech is laying off and you know, people buy the hundreds of thousands, so go figure. Um, this is, there's no safety, so you might as well major in what you love and what you can do well and what makes you a human being. Um, thank you. <laughs> And that was the impetus. <laughs> the impetus was really rage, and rage is great rocket fuel for writing, as I'm sure you know. Um, and I'm I'm very pleased to be. You know, there are other books in this um, who've been that have been honored that are books on a mission, and this is a book on a mission um, as well. So I started to ask some questions like, what hit us? And well, maybe you know, my years have been wasted. Maybe we are frivolous, fraudulent, and waste of time, as we've been told from many, many different directions. So I did a little bit of soul searching, and I started to think about teaching and what uh, what we were, what I was trying to do. I always thought my courses were important, <laughs> you know, but suddenly uh, there was another voice in the room. And so I started reading around, and sure enough, there's lots and lots of books trying to save the liberal arts, trying to um, make a case for the humanities, but they were also very abstract. So, you know, like Martha Nussbaum, who I admire greatly, um, his humanities are about the cultivation of the human and the development of a citizenry. Great, true, but you know, where's the meat? <laughs> you know, what happens in a classroom? I think most people are, are really kind of, they don't know. I mean, why should they know? They haven't been in it since they were a student. So I thought, well, I'm gonna bring the reader into my classroom and we're gonna talk about what really goes on. You're gonna meet the students because you could read these books. You could read dozens and I did and not know that there were students present, hey? <laughs> but the students are like what the whole show is about. And they're not monolithic, of course they're not, we know that, but they are um, also not uh, the same as we were, as I was, they don't read. They uh, are fixated on um, you know, um, digital media and they like instant gratification. So to get their attention is actually quite challenging and to take them through a complex text like Shakespeare, which is not for sissies. I mean, you really need to, you know, slow down and pay attention, and they're not used to going slow. They want to go fast. So I thought, you know, these people are writing about education, but they're not really talking about what it is and how it works and how it's a personal relationship, me to them, them to me, them to each other. That's terribly important because that's how you learn to live in a society, which we are forgetting. Um, you need uh, small classes where they can interact, where they can bounce their ideas off of one another um, and learn that they can disagree uh, without hating each other, you know, and at the same time uh, get along, you know. So I had an enormous amount of fun writing this book because I got to relive some of the best moments and I got to, um, you know, have the right response. You know how you think about what you should have said 30 minutes later after you leave the class. But I got to say, you know, in this book, what I would have said, <laughs> you know. It, so I got control of the conversation, which you don't always have um, when you're in the classroom. And it's enormously interesting. I mean, the, because the interactions and because what you're trying to get them to develop, what you're trying to get them to see, especially with Shakespeare, who is the sort of central human, humanist writer of our culture, and you're, trying, you're teaching humanism because, you know, humanities, <laughs> uh, humanity, I mean, these are, this is about personal development. Education is about personal development. It's not about, it, I mean, it has to do with information gathering, but that's not the primary um, goal, at least in the humanities. We are trying to develop cells that can live in society. Um, and uh, guess what, H teachers are human too, you know, and that was something else. You could read all the books in the world about education and not kind of get the sense that human, a, a teacher, had, you know, I bring my own prejudices, my own assumptions, my own stereotypes. I bring as much as they bring, you know, I can deal with it a little bit better, but uh, so that I'm, so it's a very self-conscious book, you know, it's like me kind of, um, am I doing this right? I mean, how can I, how can I bring her and shut him up and, you know, all that kind of 
it's very, very complicated. So you feel this, and I take you through a class, um, a semester class. Uh, it happens to be the year that I make the decision to retire, which was not an easy decision after 47 years and really loving it. Um, and the kids, yeah, as I say, they're different. They are punch struck with, with pressures of a sort I didn't have when I was going to college. I didn't have to work full time. I didn't have to worry about debt, and they do. And um, their attention span is uh, quite different from mine. And anyway, so, you, so it's a process. You see, you move through a semester and you see how something happens. Not to everybody, of course. I mean, there are people who don't hear you. and. Um, but there are people do, and that is an amazing experience. And you need human scale. You need a college built to human scale. You need classes built to human scale, so that um, this sort of somewhat magical kind of transformation can occur, which um, uh, I, I think they kind of can, they have a chance to grow up human. And I really see it as a site of resistance against dehumanization. I see small classes with personal interaction as a site of resistance against dehumanization, which is hollowing out our lives. Am I over? <laughs> and one more thing, the site against authoritarianism, because they learn how to think. They learn how to critique, interpret, and um, we need that, as you know. Thank you Thank very you much. So much. Thank you. That is an important topic, my friends. Now, for creative nonfiction, NCBR member Kim Shuck will present the Creative Nonfiction Award. Kim? Every one of these books was incredible. The nominees for creative nonfiction. What you don't know will make a whole new world. Dorothy Lazard. Longtime Oakland librarian Dorothy Lazard takes readers on a journey from St. Louis to California, girlhood to adulthood, personal and political. It's about family members, friends, and pivotal historical events in her life. The 1955 lynching of Emmett Till the 1968 assassination of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. and the 1970s Black Arts Movement. She offers striking portraits of the wise women who helped shape her. Her book might prompt readers to explore their own genealogy. Secret Harvests, a hidden story of separation and the resilience of a family farm. David Mas Masmodo, artwork by Patricia Wakita. A bittersweet story about family hardships, especially those endured by his aunt Shizuki. Born in 1919 with Down syndrome, she was placed in a mental institution at the same time most of the Masumoto family were imprisoned at Gila River Relocation Center when the Japanese Americans were deprived of their civil rights. And in the end, Masumoto describes his return to the farm where he grew the peaches that made him famous and brought him joy. Starstruck, a memoir of astrophysics and finding light in the dark, Serafina El Badri Nance. The writer is a woman, Egyptian American astrophysicist person. Too often, science is understood as something practiced by insulated, white coat clad, emotionless, frequently male beings. Nance's memoir is a remarkable narrative of the way that a life obsession exists within a life. This memoir is intimate, revealing, and hopeful for anyone, but particularly for women in science. Her achievements are inspiring, her prose engaging, and her passion infectious. Unraveling what I learned about life while shearing sheep, dyeing wool, and making the world's ugliest sweater by Peggy Orenstein. Peggy Orenstein brings her acute powers of observation and keen sense of compassion to a worldwide cottage industry largely dominated by women. The digressions plus the trenchant comments about the feminine and feminist cohere in a narrative 
which the author insists, in which the author insists that making something with your own hands is now almost by definition political. Knitting pushes back against the dehumanization of technology and consumer culture. Most delicious poison. The story, ooh, the story of nature's toxins from spices to vices, Noah Whiteman. The evolution of plant chemistry as a component of the survival of plants makes up a series of fascinating stories. Evolutionary biologist Noah Whiteman walks us through places, times, and dramas that surround us, often overlooked. These stories with political and economic narratives woven throughout, based on cutting edge science in the fields of evolution, chemistry, and neuroscience, may wind up on our plates and affect the world's history and possibly its future. And the Creative Nonfiction Award goes to Unraveling, what I learned about life while shearing sheep, dyeing wool, and making the world's ugliest sweater. Have I wrecked this yet? Okay, I'm going to, um, I don't know, I'm standing here holding this. Um, Peggy can't be here with us today because she woke up with COVID. So um, I'm going to make a short observation about um, <laughs> about the fact that so many of these books that are being awarded today have a component of humanity and what writers do and what we need to do in the world is to create those, those things that we might not find in our day-to-day -day life but that we need, that that's what story is about and for. All of these books were incredible, but as a knitter, I have to say I totally recommend the award winner. <laughs> Thank you for the book, Peggy. <laughs> now, the good thing about this is the last time I ruined one of those little things because I'm on this stage a lot, I also wrecked what was on the screen, so that didn't happen this time. <laughs> So we need to not touch this keyboard, correct? <laughs> so we have to be extra careful now. Um, the NCBA Recognition Award for a book or project outside of our ca categories. Dear California, The Golden State in Diaries and Letters, edited by David Kippen. Dear California, with entries for each day of the year, tells the story of California by arranging selections from centuries worth of journals and correspondence. Quoted writings from renowned figures, iconoclasts, politicians, actors, and artists, such as Cesar Chavez, Allen Ginsberg, Groucho Marx, Octavia Butler, Susan Sontag, Mark, Mark, Mark Twain, Jane Fonda, Zora Neale Hurston, Frida Kahlo, John F. Kennedy, D.H. Lawrence, um, Langston Hughes, Wallace Stegner, you get the idea. They play off each other in quirky, insightful ways. Many underscore how far we've come and how far we have to go from indigenous stories told before the Spanish arrived to present day tweets, blogs, and other ephemera. Dear California presents writings essential to understanding the diversity, antagonisms, despair, and abiding promise of this golden state. Now, David Kippen is in Mexico. That's where we tracked him down, and he will accept by video. Hi, and thank you from the bottom of a heartless old book reviewer's heart for honoring me and my book, Dear California, The Golden State, in Diaries and Letters. I feel like it goes two times over. First, because I'm here in San Miguel de Allende, Mexico at the moment, and can't be there with you. I've always hated award winners who can't be bothered to show up and collect their hardware in person, and now I'm one of them. Oh well. 
Please don't construe my absence as indifference. I desperately wish I could be there to catch up with old friends like Joyce and to meet the rest of you who hold up a Bay Area book reviewing tradition that goes back even beyond my distant predecessor, Joseph Henry Jackson. He wrote a column in the Chronicle called A Book Day, and he supposedly died in mid-broadcast while recording a book review on the radio. The other reason I feel like a ghost is that, as some of you know, I left the Bay Area in 2005 to become director of literature at the NEA in Washington, and the midwife is still running nationwide One City, One Book program called The Big Read. I came back to my hometown of, sorry, Los Angeles, in 2010 and opened a storefront bilingual nonprofit lending library in a working class immigrant neighborhood called Boyle Heights, where my immigrant family lived when they first came to America. It's called Libros Schmibros, and I encourage you all to look me up, tip me off ahead of time, and come pick up a good free book. I also started teaching writing at UCLA full time and became a critic at large for the LA Times. Uh, it's basically a glorified freelancer, but at least I still get to call myself a critic a profession I still practice with pride, and I hope you do too. Without good critics, literature will be deeply screwed. Where would, Joseph, where would Steinbeck have been without Joseph Henry Jackson to champion his earlier, iffier work? It's your job, yours and mine, to find us all the next Steinbeck, which is why I'm gonna end my thanks with a challenge. I just read an article in the New York Times, sorry Chronicle, about what a great news town San Francisco is becoming again, thanks to all its nascent nonprofit news organizations. I echo this feeling wholeheartedly, but I know what you know. Nonprofit newsrooms, like their for profit cousins, concentrate on investigative reporting, not cultural coverage in general, let alone book reviewing. So if any of you are looking for a new battle to march into, here's mine. Tell your friends at The Chronicle, at Mission Local, at San Francisco Bayview, at Gazetteer, at The Standard, and The Bay Citizen, and every nonprofit newsroom around the country. Newsrooms can't thrive by muckraking alone. If you want an intelligent readership, you go where the readers are. So you assign book reviews, you start a capital campaign to hire a critic. The intellectual life of your town may depend on it. Harumph, and thanks again. NCBR reviewer Lee Rossi will present poetry. Here's the certificate. Careful not to put it in there. Thank you, Joyce. Hi, I'm Lee Rossi. It's great to be here. Um, it's been another astonishing year for poetry in the Northern California and California in general. The, nom <clears throat> the nominees for poetry are Light and Clay, New and Selected Poems by Maxine Chernoff. Oh, there we go. A fitting capstone to a distinguished career in poetry. This new volume continues her 50-year love affair with the prose poem. Unlike many contemporary writers, she does not write much about herself or her day-to-day -day life. As she tells us, I'm more interested in paying attention to the world than paying attention to myself. The world needs me more. Here is a philosophical poet who encourages and enables her reader to embrace the immensity and variety of our world. Next book, In the Cities of Sleep, Elizabeth C. Heron. This wonderful new book is a seismic song of global warming and connection, global warning and connection, a great lyric report on the Earth's history of human and environmental calamity, on the brutalities of war, the stripping away of the planet's resiliencies, catastrophic ecological and human disasters. The poems focus in on the many nightmares of the past as well as those that surround us now, but they do so while reminding us that there is still hope. Egg Tooth by Jesse Nathan. Freedom challenges form in these contemporary pastoral, embracingly anti-pastoral poems. Using a template created by 
17th century metaphysical poet, John Donne, we know him well. Nathan forges a new, a new poetics of assonance, slant rhyme, and loose rhythms. The journey from childhood to adulthood, from country to city, from past to present, these are familiar themes posing alienation against belonging. But here, they feel new, current, and vital to our time. Next, the disordered, <coughs> disordered alphabet, Cynthia Santana. The disordered alphabet examines the personal as well as the historic by way of a, a dismantled dictionary, which the poet rebuilds and makes strange. The collection utilizes an array of forms, including epistles to the letters of the alphabet, that's to say letters to the letters, um, odes, notes and list poems, and abecedarian poems. The modes used enhance the concerns of the speaker, making for complex, curious poems that could have been written by no other poet. Leviathan by Michael Shoemaker. Named Job by his mother, Jay, refuses the moniker, insisting that faith has failed to sustain him. As Jay dies, he is called to task for some heinous crime he committed but never paid for, and a crime committed against him that left him ruined. A story that on the surface is about rural America, Texas, oil, money, and power, is at its core a morality play. But where are the lines of morality drawn? Reading Shoemaker is to witness the ways in which we are trapped if not by guilt, then by grief and memory. And finally, Songbirds of the Nine Rivers by Joseph Zaccardi. The poems in this wonderful book took root when Joseph Zaccardi, as an 18-year-old Army corpsman, deployed to rescue and care for the dying and severely wounded during the Vietnam War, found solace in the discovery of an anthology of Chinese and Vietnamese poetry. Can you imagine? Steeped in history, Zaccardi inhabits and re-inhabits the spirit and events of the time, bringing alive the voices of the Tang and Li dynasties, Du Fu, Li Bai, Wang Wei, Nguyen Trai, among others. And the award in poetry goes to the disordered alphabet, <laughs> Cynthia Santana. And here she is. <laughs> Congratulations. Thank you. Here's your award. Don't put it down there. No. <laughs> okay. Okay, I can't be the only writer up here who did not write a speech because I thought it would be really bad luck and I guess it worked. <laughs> ah. I am amazed. Um, I'm not the youngest of writers, and this is my first book, and it means so much um, to be heard, as all these books nominated and all the categories have. Um, I hope, I don't know what the convention is, but I hope that we get a picture with everybody whose book was nominated here um, at the end. Thank you so much, uh, Joyce. Poetry Flash is an amazing, amazing organization, and we're so lucky it's right here. Um, that organization is just a gold mine and has been for so long, and I don't know how you do it. Um, thank you to all the judges and all the categories who read so much. Uh, that's kind of stunning. <laughs> I know people receive many boxes of books, so thank you for taking the time to do that. I know it's most likely a labor of love. <laughs> um, thank you for the library for hosting us. Thank you for all the writing groups uh, here and afar who have, uh, all the people who have given me uh, encouragement and feedback. Um, to my husband, Hideo, he always has believed in me. So um, he says he'll retire soon so I can make us the big bucks. Um, 
So get ready. <laughs> Put in your letter. Um, I'm going to read just one poem. Um, as Lee said, there are poems to each letter of the alphabet, as well as some other uh, poems and other letters. Oh, yeah, I'm supposed to thank the letter R, because the letter R wrote me back um, at the very last minute in this book. Um, I had to scrap my original intent for the R poem, and then R wrote me a letter. <laughs> this is my poem for the letter V, voice. A spruce does not speak, but for you listening to the borer like a corkscrew through the bark, to the sound made each time it hits a new ring, a history to be milled, lathed into pale ribbons, released through sound holes in the shape of letters or rosettes, a sound that holds the flick, the fell, the small V, the ax, delivers to the trunk. For you, I timber. And riven, I river through air. Vibrato, the violence in the violin. And the saplings born to suffer in my shadow grow. Thank you so much. Fiction will be presented by NCBR member Joy Lanzendorfer. Hi. Oh, wow. Thank you. Um, this is, you know, thank you for coming out today, um, celebrating all these really just amazing books. I, I'm, I know I'm going to be reading a lot, even though I just did, because I just read a lot of fiction, and I am very pleased with our nominees in fiction. Uh, North Woods by Daniel Mason. North Woods begins with two lovers escaping a 17th century Puritan colony to build a cabin in the woods. Over time, the cabin grows and changes under the influence of different residents. Unca uncanny and often very funny, Northwoods examines the effect of human interactions on the natural world, reminding us that we're all a part of history and that the past is still very much alive. The Dog of the North, Elizabeth Mackenzie. This is a funny, freewheeling wheeling novel about the complex family inheritances that grace and disgrace us. Sometimes bizarre, sometimes heartrending, sometimes horrific, and sometimes just hilarious. One scene topples into the next, pulling us along with Penny as she worries and argues, travels and reminisces, begs and cajoles with friends and foe to salvage her sanity and learn what has befallen those she loves. Wildflowers. Beverly Pereno, I'm sorry, Pereno. These nine short stories each feature a Filipino American girl or woman surprised by turn of fate, by kindness disguised as anger, mistreatment represented as good fortune, by mortality. In each tale, Beverly Pereno offers glimpses into overlooked worlds and lives, each one observed with quiet, understated attention. Her subdued voice and patient command of detail underscore the emotional power of these stories. Forget I told you this, Hilary Zaid. Amy Black is a queer single mother and a calligrapher. One night, a, string, a stranger asks her to transcribe a love letter for him, but then suddenly disappears chased by federal agents. 
or so it seems. But nothing is quite what it seems in this futuristic thriller that offers the beauty of hand-drawn calligraphy as a counterweight to Q, the world's largest social media company, where our algorithms predict not just what people covet, but where they are, what they do, and why. Land of Milk and Honey, C. Pam Jong. In this dystopian climate change novel, a man-made fog has covered the world, drastically reducing the food supply. An American chef longs for the disappearing flavors of her past, the sourness of endive and the sweetness of strawberry. She's accepted to cook at an elite research community in the Italian Alps, privately owned by a reclusive capitalist. This novel is a sensuous investigation into decadence, greed, and the consequences of dwindling resources. And the award for fiction goes to North Woods, Daniel Mason. <laughs> And uh, Daniel Mason will accept by video. Hello. I suppose that if they're playing this recording, then I have the fortune of having been awarded the Northern California Book Award this year. Thank you. I'm very sorry that I'm away and unable to be at the event and imagine that the ceremonies in the beautiful halls and auditorium of the public library are as filled with the wonderful energy of books and readers as in the past. I first began coming to the San Francisco Public Library back when I was a medical student nearly 20 years before, and I can recall traveling down from UCSF to Market Street and the different world I found there, with the streets bustling outside and the grandeur of City Hall and the procession of readers from every walk of San Francisco life. My novel, Northwoods, takes place in New England, but I began writing it on the peninsula back during the early days of COVID, when I would go for daily walks with my kids in the hills and so in many ways, it feels to me to be a book founded in the Santa Cruz mountains. And my love of the forests and my fear for them are very much a love and fear that have their roots there. Thank you again for the honor to be included among such other writers, both in fiction and in other categories, and to the NCBR, to, know, to our local bookstores, our libraries, all for being such an important part of Northern California literary life. The Northern California Book Awards were co-founded by the late Fred Cody, legendary Berkeley bookseller and reviewer, in 1981. He simply wanted to talk books over lunch. Could you give a guy a break? The award in his name has gone to an amazing array, array of our most crucial writers and thinkers and literary figures publishers. We are delighted and honored to present the Fred Cody Award for Lifetime Achievement and Service to Jane Hirschfield. Throughout her five decades of writing and ten published books of poems, including Ledger, The Beauty, After, Given Sugar, Given Salt, and The Lives of the Heart, her two classic essays on poetry, Ten Windows, How Great Poems Transform the World, and Nine Gates, Entering the Mind of Poetry. Translations of Mirabai with Robert Bly, The Ink Dark Moon, Love Poems by Ono no Komachi and Izumi Shikabu, Women of the Ancient Court of Japan, and an anthology, Women in Praise of the Sacred, 43 Centuries of Spiritual Poetry by Women. She opens her individual life to the larger shared life of our earthly journey. Her poems find the balance point where the personal enacts and suggests the universal, both vivid and felt and shared, echoing. The Asking is her long-awaited new and selected collection. 
a leading advocate for the biosphere and the alliance of science and the imagination, and one of America's American poetry's central spokespersons for the biosphere, Jane Hirschfield is founder of Poets for Science, poetsforscience.org, a collection of poems, a participatory installation, and a movement exploring the connection between science and poetry. Poems from the project were displayed at the March for Science on the National Mall in 2017. She believes that poetry should be an urgent witness, not a passive bystander, to climate catastrophe. Jane was in China when we contacted her, receiving a prestigious international poetry award that has never gone to an American or a woman before. On her way to Provincetown, Massachusetts, where she is giving a workshop today, right at this moment, she said, I'm so stunned and honored. Thank you. Speechless. How does this happen? Just today, I was talking about my first reading for you at Cody's. <laughs> so a little jet lagged because literally this woman is our international ambassador of poetry. Here she is. I am so sorry to be with you today on a screen and not in person. Um, forgive me. I was committed elsewhere. And I would have liked, I think, today to have spent my time with you simply reading, saying the names of the previous Fred Cody Award winners and of Fred himself. Uh, I think that each of us would have, hearing this, uh, gone through the remembrance of a particular shift in the world, in literature, in our own lives. I remember when the first Fred Cody Award was given, I think I was there in the room that time, and as I read through the names of those who have received it, I find an entire era of understanding changing and world changing in their books and in their actions. These 37 writers have been geomorphological forces in this world, and I am humbled and astonished to join such a list. I thank the Northern California Book Reviewers Association and I thank all of you for profoundly for thinking I might be worthy. It remains implausible to me. That this award comes from the home community I've lived in for so long is also humbling. It's the community that showed me when I began to be a writer what the life of a writer can be like, filled Yes, with silence and solitude and struggling with the line on the page that just won't come right, but filled also with conversation, with the company, the words, the thoughts and examples and errors of everyone who is trying to do the same thing, the living and the dead. As a young writer looking around, what I saw in this Northern California community of writers was a community of unparalleled generosity and welcome, of dedication and of service of every shape and kind. Also, the unparalleled willingness to be peculiar and singular and strange. To, in Ceylon's phrase, say out your say, that in itself is one of the roads to freedom. People write what draws them to be written, and look what happens. I think more and more of Kavafi's line from a poem that is uh, not as well known as it could be. Uh, he said, for some people, the day comes when they have to declare the great yes or the great no. Every one of those 37 writers whose names I'm not saying, found something that they simply had to say yes to or simply could not say no to or keep silent before. 
And look what happens. A war is helped to end. An understanding of our relationship to plants is completely upended. We learn to think in watersheds and mountains, an industry that preyed on people during the worst days of their lives. Well, it was held to account. A bookstore turns into a publishing house that changes everything. Lives unheard and unseen became heard, became seen. And language began turning some new somersaults and going some new directions. When I find myself doubting, as every poet or writer must, that what we write ever changes anything, and when I feel haunted by Auden's line, poetry makes nothing happen, sometimes I can remember some of those words that have changed everything. It's a great paradox. Ink on a page or a voice speaking in oddly musical tones in the ear turn no lever of the world's machinery. Yet a poem can turn one person into another. What I write most often these days is postcards uh, to unregistered voters in swing states suggesting they register and suggesting they might vote for the future and not for fear. But I do that because of the person words turned me into. For some people, the day comes when they have to declare the great yes or the great no. Meeting that day fully is what any life of service is. A person who says the great yes or, if it's time for that, the great no to what comes to them in this life with its questions that require of us some response becomes maybe Daniel Ellsberg or Tilly Olson or Maxine Hong Kingston, who lost a book she'd been writing for almost a decade to the Oakland Hills fire, presage of all the fires that have followed, and started writing it again newly and continued teaching her workshop for veterans. Imagination is the first and the central tool of literature. It's exercising is the only tool we have for feeling the future in the present and for weighing the consequences of an action not only after it has happened, but before. You know, we have not yet had a global nuclear war. That isn't because of the doctrine of mutually assured destruction. It is because people imagined what the unimaginable would look like, and so far, imagining it, we have chosen to step back. I think that imagination also means that what happens to anyone can be recognized as happening to all of us, to any of us. When you describe something in a poem or in a novel, it awakens inside you and it awakens the faculty of imagination and empathy and compassion inside you. What happens to anyone, a war, falling in love, falling in exhaustion or hunger or despair, you can't read a mention of even an orange in a sentence without the part of your brain that controls the taste buds or responds to the taste buds, awakening a little. And so in writing or in reading, there's no separating yourself into it and me or us and them. There's only one immediate, completely connected existence. I know that everything I'm saying can be argued with. I know that words can inflame hatred as much as compassion. But art, good art, cannot. It refuses the task. And eventually people get tired of shouting. It hurts the ears and it hurts the heart. And then when we're ready for something else, something a little more complicated, 
and full of shadows and subtle and moving in more than one direction, there will be a play or a story or a novel or a poem to help. It will help show that there's another way to live in this world and move through it, to show that where there is damage, there can be damages recognition, and when there is recognition, there can be remedy, circumvention, repair, unmaking. To show that it's possible to recalibrate a life with unexpectedness, remade connection, and laughter is also part of what art does. One shift of word can do it. Groucho Marx's joke. Outside, a dog, a book is a man's best friend. Inside a dog, it's too dark to see. I love that joke. I love it because it makes me laugh, and I love it because it admits that any part of a human life is going to end up sometimes where it is too dark to see. Some words, sometimes finding my own, more often reading the words of others, have kept me company at such a time. Joyce suggested that I read a few poems. I think there is barely time for one. Um, I will read you a poem that uh, did change my own life. It was written in 2010 as the science of climate change became ever more clear, even though we'd known about these things since before I was born. Um, it's a poem that hopes to make itself erased from this world. If it were fully heard and it were followed, it would make no sense because we would behave differently. And after I wrote it, I was very frightened and I began to behave differently. Let them not say. Let them not say we did not see it. We saw. Let them not say we did not hear it. We heard. Let them not say they did not taste it. We ate. We trembled. Let them not say it was not spoken, not written. We spoke. We witnessed with voices and hands. Let them not say they did nothing. We did not enough. Let them say as they must say something. A kerosene beauty, it burned. Let them say we warmed ourselves by it, read by its light, praised, and it burned. I hope I have been some small part of making my own poem eventually untrue. I thank you all for your faith that words can assist in these things. Wow, okay, wow. Please join us at the reception across the lobby in the Latino community room, meeting room. We have tasty food for you and drink starting now. The library would love it and it, we can help the library by getting over there and into the lobby to look at the books and into the reception room quickly. And um, that would be a great help. Thanks to the booksmith, San Francisco, who helped us with the books. Be generous, support these authors at independent bookstores. And thanks again to the San Francisco Public Library. Thanks to each of you for joining us. Thank you.